Good morning, my name is Ralph Friedrichs and thank you for joining us today on Take Your Life Back. We're going to talk about something that's really, really uh, important because it's an everyday occurrence all over the world and that's grief and alcohol abuse. But before we go in there, let's go like I always talk about and that's to plug my good friend Dr. Luis Gonzalez from Starting Point. Dr. Gonzalez has two entities to his business. The first entity is to coach, to help you go from your addiction to your recovery, to walk with you, to struggle with you. He will set goals daily and will help you lift the questions that you have on the outside with the an answers you already have that are on the inside of you. He will help you with that. He is not a uh, counselor and he's not a therapist. He is a master recovery coach just as I am and he will help you step by step and walk with you. On the other side of his business, he can make you a uh, addiction recovery coach if you possess passion, personality, and professional uh, professionalism and you have some addiction background whether it be in your own or a loved one. So you can reach out to Dr. Luis Gonzalez at Starting Point, which is www.startingpointmn.com. You can also call him at 844-414-8444. Now, my business, uh, I have two entities on my side, and the first one is for informational purposes, and that is called clearviews.info. Now, clearviews.info is an informational website for addiction and recovery, anything related to drugs and alcohol, articles, videos, uh, puzzles, a few games, a couple little cartoons. You can find all that on www.clearviews.info. On my other side of the business, I have Clear Reform, that's C-L-E-A-R, R-E-F-O-R-M. Clear Reform is kind of like what Dr. Luis Gonzalez does. Uh, the only difference is, is that I will coach you. He coaches you and he also makes you a coach. I just coach you. I will help you from your addiction to your recovery. I will walk step by step with you daily. And that's what I do at Clear Reform. That's www.clearreform.com. I will also help you lift those answers that you have to your questions that are deep inside you. I'll help you lift them out because you do know what the answers are for your future. You just need to uh, have somebody uh, work with you to get them out into the open. I will never ever let you walk along throughout your struggle. All you need to do is reach out to me at 844-405-HELP and I will walk with you daily. Uh, I will not let you struggle alone and I will help you take your life back. Now, we spoke about Dr. Luis Gonzalez and we spoke about my business. What I do want to speak about before we go into grief and alcohol abuse is uh, I overheard a conversation yesterday and this was in reference to a person was talking about another person who's in their family who was so cheap uh, they have all the money in the world that you can imagine. They have all the uh, furniture and all and the person talking about this person has really nothing. This is a family member. And uh, the family member's point was uh, that uh, the older person that wouldn't share anything really can't take anything with them when they die. And God does judge you on how you are towards other people. So uh, my thing here was to come up with this, and, and that is to tell you folks that you'll never see a U-Haul truck follow a hearse. Now what does that mean? That means that you cannot take your world possessions with you. That's all that really means. Isn't it better to share what you have with your loved ones and your family while you're alive and you can enjoy it than to have those family members fight over your possessions because there won't be a U-Haul truck following your hearse one day. God will judge you on gen generosity, on caring, on love, on how you help and step up to the plate to help other people. So don't think for one minute that you are going to have a U-Haul following your hearse because it won't happen. And another thing was I wanted to also bring this up because I overheard the same person talking about achieving goals. And folks, you will never achieve anything in life, anything, without setting your goal first. For an example, I can achieve these videos daily 
with that my goal being to have the reading material plastered onto my laptop, to have a game thought in my mind of what am I talking about, who am I going to talk about, and what commercials to splice into it. Those are, girl, are goals. So I can't achieve any of what I just spoke about without those goals. So if you want to achieve anything in life, anything, you need to set a goal. Set priorities for your goals. A major part of successful living lies in the ability to put things first. Indeed, the reason most major goals are not achieved is that we spend our time doing second things first. You need to set what's most important in achieving. So your goals are to set the first thing to achieve, the second thing to achieve. You need to set your priorities for the goals. Don't put the second thing before the first thing. But folks, you will never achieve anything without setting a goal. Grief and alcohol abuse. Let me read this. This is coming directly from the CDC. Some people turn to alcohol to numb their feelings of grief. When you have a loved one, a husband, a wife, a child. Photo credit girl with a bottle of alcohol image by Dr. Khan from Fotilia uh, was designed. And this is a photo that was designed on the website of a girl who just lost her, I believe it was her father, and she was handcuffed to a bottle of whiskey and that's what they're talking about. Grief is defined as a body's natural response to loss according to the helpguide.org. Excuse me. When someone is going through grief from the loss of a loved one or a major traumatic event, turning to alcohol often, often happens. This is considered an unhealthy way to deal with the underlying issue of grief. But we as humans will automatically do that. Folks, I was turning to alcohol and I wasn't even grieving. So can you imagine if you lost a loved one, how you might start drinking, turning to alcohol? Because you want to escape the sadness. You want to escape the grieving. Reasons that some people do this. Some people turn to alcohol after a traumatic event, that event because it helps them disassociate with the problems and the numbs, the reality of today's activities. They may show signs of binge drinking or becoming dependent to alcohol to curb anxiety, depression, or symptoms of alcohol withdrawal such as nausea and shakiness. This commonly occurs in someone who has recently experienced a traumatic event such as a loss of a loved one, loss of a job, a terminal diagnosis, or a divorce. Turning to alcohol for support can easily become a cycle that needs immediate treatment. Immediate. And we're going to talk about treatments in a little bit. My certain treatments that I talk about during every video, we're going to talk about them. Types of grief. Helpguide.org mentions five stages of grief developed by psychiatrist Elizabeth Cooper Ross. These stages are not in order when we talk about them, one being the highest and five being the lowest. They all start with denial, anger, and bargaining followed by depression and acceptance. They say they all start. You can jump around a little bit, believe me. The emotions that are experienced during this time are also associated with deep pain and loneliness, especially when you have lost a loved one, especially then. The alcohol masks the feeling, but can often prolong the grieving process because problems with alcohol now have to be dealt with. If you know of someone who has recently suffered a great loss, there are signs to look for signifying the possibility of alcohol abuse, according to the Health Committee's website. This includes slurred beach, uh, speech, poor uh, coordination, impaired judgment, and talkativeness. That used to be my biggest one my wife would say you like chatting Kathy <laughs> no no picking on Kathy of course other signs may include the smell of alcohol on a person's clothing or poor hygiene if the bereaved begins to hide alcohol bottles around their home or in their car and drinks in isolation such as closet drinking this could also be a sign of alcohol abuse that is out of control there are other things to turn to rather than alcohol if, if you are grieving for the loss of a loved one or suffering from traumatic event. You know, folks, we can all sit here and say all this, but if we're not in that person's uh, shoes, 
Yes, we are here to advise and help them as much as possible, but you always have to remember what might it be like, like if I lost my wife. I would hope to God that I'm strong enough in sobriety not to turn to the bottle. But we all are human, and as humans as such, we need to be very compassionate towards other humans that are going through this. Don't just shake it off and say, well, it's easy to do, because you don't know. Let's get back. Uh, the National Mental, Mental Health Information Center explains that seeking help for your, uh, seek support for your family and friends, I'm sorry, explain seeking help for your grief depends on the severity of its effect on you. Instead of turning to alcohol, seek support from family and friends. Take on new hobbies or engage in, engage in activities to stimulate your mind and help you focus on the tasks at hand. Some people comfort or find comfort in religious support and attend church or practice spiritual care regularly. Folks, we all do constantly need to, to reach for our higher power, whether it's the loss of a loved one, loss of a job, loss of any really thing or just not even a loss we shouldn't just turn to higher power when we're down we should be turned to higher power for everything even if you win lottery reach to your higher power and figure out how you can share your wealth so you don't have the impression that you have a u-haul one day following your hearse because you cannot take anything with you seeking help if you think you are dealing with your grief is in an unhealthy way by drinking too much alcohol it may be time to seek professional help if you drink heavily up to three or more times per day you may need to enter an alcohol detox program to safely stop drinking because a lot of people just can't stop without um, having some sort of side effects the body experiences withdrawal symptoms such as headaches muscle twitching anxiety desire to drink as it detoxes seek support through a program how to comfort a friend after the death. This is the most important because we're all, sooner or later, going to run into a person that we might have to help during a, a, a trying time of a, a loss of a loved one. So these are seven simple steps, not simple, seven steps to help. In order to follow these steps, what do we need to do in order to achieve doing these steps? We have to set goals. Remember, you never will achieve anything without setting a goal, folks. It's that simple. And I want to emphasize that over and over and over again. I speak about action plan and everything that we speak about. Action plan. And we're going to talk about my definition of your and my chapters in the book of life. The reason I'm bringing that up right now is because we spoke about the U-Haul and the hearse. We spoke about achieving how you can't achieve without a goal. Your book of life, your chapter is written in the beginning by you and your parents and then at the end, towards the end by you alone, all have to include your higher power. And we're going to talk about that. Let's go into this first. Someone who has lost a loved one can feel isolated the Merriam-Webster Dictionary says to, uh, to be bereaved is to be suffering the death of a loved one. It can be challenging to know what to do in the time of friend's loss. It's very challenging. But what's important is that you offer your support and encouragement. The comforter should be ready to face a number of psychological states caused by suffering and bereavement. Step number one, listen, listen, and listen folks as a master addiction recovery coach one of my biggest things is to listen to listen and to listen less talk more listening listen even when your friend doesn't say anything listen by watching body language expressions words do not have to leave the mouth for you to understand a person the bereaved may go over and over the last days or some of the other aspects of his life with the person that they lost if you lost a husband or a wife, they might talk about, geez, we were just at dinner at Applebee's three nights ago. Let them talk and listen. Don't try to out-talk them. The bereaved may go over and over the last few days and other aspects of anything uh, of the person's uh, last days with this person in their life. Just be there to witness. 
It's not necessary to say anything other than it will be okay. We all are here to help you and we all love you. Sometimes a person may not talk, but he or she will still need someone just to be there. A crutch, a support. Step two. Know the five stages of grief by Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a Swiss psychiatrist. She did a number of studies with people near death. She developed a model il illustrating the stages someone grieving goes through. Her five stages are denial, isolation, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. The comforter should be aware of the prepared for these stages. Accept them gently, help the bereaved move through them together. Understand that everyone, number three, understand that everyone grieves, grieves differently. Some people act uh, like they have a shield around them. They won't let anybody talk to them. Some people act like there is no big deal going on, but they're hurting inside. There is no way to grieve. There is no one way to grieve and no prescribed length of time for the mourning. Notes a University of Rochester medical website. Some people will mourn for decades over the loss and others will be have an intense but short period of mourning. Everybody mourns in a different way. Still, others may not appear or may appear not to be mourning at all, processing the loss in the private uh, settings in her own home. Don't press bereave to feel or behave in any particular way. If you see someone that lost a husband and wife and they are acting like no big deal, let them mourn in their own way. It is not for you to decide how a person should mourn. No one decides how another person mourns. Everybody mourns in a different way. If you have another person that has lost somebody two years ago and is still mourning, let them. Number four, help the bereaved meet their daily needs. Often people in deep gr grief neglect their own needs, notes Roberta Team, psychi psychiatrist and author of Solace. Finding your way through grief and learning to live again. Writing for the website BelieveNet.com, which is about loss. They may not eat or shower. Traditionally way of helping someone through their grieving process is by bringing food, enough for a few easy prepare meals, preferably that they can just put in a microwave in a Tupperware. You can do that. This gives direct aid and emotional comfort. Another way is to minister the needs of the bereaved is to offer help, pay bills, organize mail, and do simple household tasks. Be involved with the person that is bereaving. You have to be involved. Like it says, most often they will not eat or uh, shower, otherwise hygiene. There's not much you can do with the hygiene part of it, but try to bring them those little Tupperwares for frozen meals in them. Something they can just pop in a microwave, and even then they might not do it. Even at this particular junction, offer them things like junk food. That would maybe break the ice a little. Number five, recognize even more help is needed. While most people work their way through the grieving process and there is no real time limit for grieving for anyone, it is important to see some improvement, especially around the area of the bereaved meeting daily needs. Um, if after several weeks your friend still cannot prepare a meal or engage in a simple hygiene, there might be a problem. Similarly, if after several months your friend is not returned to work for any of her or any of her normal um, patterns of behavior, encourage him or her to see a counselor or a therapist. You might even consider arranging an intervention. Folks, we hear about this all the time. And what, what we do hear about is when a spouse dies, especially a spouse uh, that was with this uh, beloved one that passed, for, I, I, I'm just going to use a number, 50 years, how within the same year that the other person dies. And that is called loneliness. They Remember, they were with this person for all these years, many years. So these people depended on each other. And now husband is gone. And what's the wife to do? She won't eat, she won't pay bills, she will not clean herself. You might, if you cannot physically help this person, when I say physically, I mean if this person won't allow you to do anything, you might have to have an intervention. Number six, move the bereaved to recovery. 
As a person grieving passes through the worst of the grief, the comforter can help him or her move forward. The phrase, get back out there, seems like a cliche, but a certain point the bereave does probably need to begin introducing elements of fun and success back into their own life. Life is for the living, and it really doesn't do the dead any good for living uh, to curl up into a ball after the loved one is gone. Encourage simple steps at first, like maybe just going to the mall, going to the supermarket. Number seven, create boundaries. Grieving people may not be sensitive to the needs of, uh, of the comforter. This is coming from an experience when you run into older people, they don't realize how insulting they can be when you ask to help them. But folks, this is exactly what this means. This is a, not only an older person probably, but a grieving person. So what they're saying is you need to create those boundaries because the grieving people may not be sensitive to the needs of you. If she is in a dark pit of despair or need, she might try to pull you in with her. That comes back to the negativities. And she's not being negative purposely, but it's just happening. When offering help, decide how much help you are capable of giving financially, emotionally, and regard of how much time you can give. Stay close to that boundary. Ask for help if the bereaved needs more. If you are a son or daughter helping your mom or your dad, ask your siblings to help you. Folks, you know, it's, it's, it, bereaving is a terrible thing. And uh, sooner or later, each and every one of us sitting here will have to do, do that. So, you know, we talk about losing someone. We talked about the U-Haul not following a hearse. And we're talking about achieving that cannot happen without goals. We, talking about, we talked about setting your priorities. But if you put all that together in a nutshell, we are talking about your life and your chapters in your book of life. And your book of life started at birth, like mine in 1961, and will end at your death, like mine, whenever that might be for you and me. From zero, when God gave your parents you, God entrusted your parents a perfect child. Your parents and you will together write the first 18 chapters in your book. Each chapter in, uh, identifies as one year alive. So from birth until 18, your parents and you need to write these chapters together. Why are your parents involved in that? Because they are your hero, your role model. What parents need to do and I'm speaking directly to the parents now what parents need to do to be part of writing that those 18 chapters in the book of life of your child is to set certain standards as a role model standards that include not drinking in front of your children not smoking in front of your children not hitting or abusing another person at all doesn't matter if it's in front of your children or not and not to use profanity that is what God had instilled as you in you as a parent. That is where your involvement comes in setting the first 18 chapters in your child's life. That is where you help write those chapters. Part of also, besides those four things that I mentioned, which are smoking, drinking, uh, abuse, physical and verbal, and profanity, your job also is to unite the family as the role model. What does that mean? That is to have family dinner nights together. In today's society and the quick world we live in, it's very hard to have mommy and daddy sit down and have dinner with the children every night. I do understand it. I get it. What I don't get is the fact that we don't even have one or two of those at night anymore during the week. My recommendation is to have Fridays, Saturdays, and Sunday nights your family nights. I just did a video which you folks will see in the beginning of this. Uh, not this one. This was uh, Sunday's special. And the title is Family and Worship Days Together Combined on a Sunday. Do family things and worship your God on Sundays. So as the role model that God has entitled you to to help write those chapters in the first 18 chapters in the book of life for your child, 
is to be a role model. If you need to smoke, go outside. If you need to drink, do it away from your children. If you need to physically abuse other people, seek therapy and counseling. And if you're the victim watching me right now, if you have been abused physically or verbally, call the authorities. I know I say this all the time, but a slap and a punch here will cause possibly it to accelerate to a knife or a gun. It is easier to call the authorities and have the abuser hauled away in handcuffs than to have someone else call the authorities to have your body taken out in a body bag. Be a role model, folks. Just as my parents had to be a role model in my first 18 years, which we're going to go over now. I was born in 1961. At 17, I left home, graduated high school, went to college, joined the Marine Corps. 1981, I'm in boot camp. Chaplain taps me on the shoulder and asks me to come into the quiet room where he politely asked me to become a lay leader. Of course, I had no clue what a lay leader was until he explained. Remember this date, 1981. Remember the job function as a lay leader to be between the recruit and the chaplain. So you put that aside now because we're going to go deeper into the story. 1981, lay leader between the recruit and the chaplain, the liaison. Those were already started. My I started writing my own chapters because remember, from 1 to 18, my parents were involved. Normal childhood, ups and downs here and there. At eight, 17, 18, I started writing my own which started going downhill with alcoholism. 18, 1981, I became a lay leader. I'm going to fast forward now through the book. Chapters are written every year, every year, all the way to 2009 where I had a bad accident in the Marine Corps. Uh, excuse me, in Alaska. I did have an accident in the Marine Corps, but that was 1983. This is 2009. I am now on workman's comp at home every single day for three years. So my chapters are starting to get worse and worse because of my drinking. All my chapters in my book of life that I have written on my own are due to my drinking. That are not promising those chapters. Yes, they, every chapter had a highlight of something good because I am a good person. But alcohol or drug addiction will suck you into the, its own little game and, and, and or its own little disease. And no matter how good you are, you will always have bad chapters as long as you have that addiction. So between 2009 being home now and 2011, God tapped me on my shoulder again. Now remind you, 81, I became a lay leader. So in 2011, 30 years exactly, God again said, Ralph, are you ready to continue helping people like you started in 1981 as a lay leader? I gave it a shot again. We formed Mastic Beach Outreach 2011, which is to help the physical, mentally, and older people. God noticed, yes, he still has that good feeling of helping other people, but, but he is still an alcoholic and he has major alcohol issues and addictions. So God said, okay. I am going to continue letting you write your own chapters in your book. So now we're going to fast forward from 2011 to 2013. June 22nd, 2013, I finally hit rock bottom. That should be a day of celebration for me. June 22nd, 2013. It is then that God finally knew that my chapters in my book of life from June 22nd, 2013 to the rest of my life will be written as such. But God also knew he was not finished with me yet. He knows I can talk to people. He knows I care about people. He knows I have now eliminated my addiction by learning how to fight with it. But I still needed to fine tune my abilities to work between two entities. And that would be like in the Marine Corps between the recruit and a chaplain. But in God's view, he wanted me to work between person with addiction and seeking recovery and sobriety. So out of nowhere, God brought Dr. Luis Gonzalez from starting point into my life. We didn't know each other, but Dr. Luis Gonzalez saw a couple of my videos, thought they were quite interesting in how my approach of recovery uh, is put into videos that we both 
talked quite a few amount of times, and then decided that I would go through his program at a at, uh, starting point uh, to become a addiction recovery coach. 2014, my chapter's now been getting better because of my hit rock bottom, 2013. 2014, I graduate from starting point, did excellent in my final exam, and now God has finally said to himself, Ralph is now here, ready to go on his own. Ralph is now a servant of myself to go out and help other people. And through my higher power, which is my God, I am here sitting before you today to tell you that life in sobriety is a million times better than life with addiction. I can speak clearly, I can see clearly, I can remember more, and I, I live healthier, and I live for a reason, a purpose. And it's people like you watching, that is my reason and my purpose. Because I am a servant to my God as a master addiction recovery coach. If I can only help two people per video, that is an accomplishment. I am guaranteed to help one person every single time I do this video, and that person is me. When I do these videos, I'm doing it for you and for me. This is my method of dealing with uh, my addiction daily. So folks, what it really comes down to, what I'm really trying to say here is that you have to be a role model and you have to help your child write his or her uh, chapters in the book of life from zero when God entrusted you with a perfect child all the way to 18 at least. If you set the right role model at home, you set the stages of love and care in your own home, when that child leaves at 18 and sees how nasty society is, this child is prepared with love already, with care, with gratitude. But if you don't set those guidelines at home and you don't become a role model, when your child hits society, it will blend right in because what's out there has already been in your home. Put a wall between society and your house. Do not let your child see what society is like until you have fully addressed every issue such as love, caring, compassion, generosity. Don't become like that conversation I heard and thinking that there's a U-Haul behind a hearse. Share what you have, teach your children to share. It's that simple. Help your children write their book of life or their chapters. Because then, if you help from zero and 18, when your child leaves at 18, you are now in a position to know that you have done everything right to help this child. So in case something goes wrong and your children end up in front of Jerry Springer or Maury or uh, Steve Wilkos and they say it's because of my parents I turned out this way, you have the know or the knowledge knowing that it's not you, that you have done everything right, that you have spent family nights together eating, you have done family outings together, you have talked about caring and sharing. But if you don't do any of those and include your drinking and include your smoking and your physical abuse and your profanity, then you are just preparing your child for society at the age of zero. Because they are ready. Because that's exactly what's out there. But you need to put a guard up, put a wall up, teach your children, be a role model. That's, that's really what you have to do, folks. So the different methods that we spoke about that I promised I would do in two minutes, which was 10 minutes ago. If you truly want to make today your first day of uh, sobriety, go to AA. What they have is 90 day meetings or 90 meetings in 90 days. They have the 12 step program. AA has helped millions of people. And I don't want anyone out there to be under the impression just because it didn't work for me that it doesn't work. It didn't work for me because I didn't allow it to work for me because I had higher goals to be more involved. I didn't want to just show up in a meeting for an hour a day. These videos, although are just about an hour or so, take two hours to prepare, an hour to do, and maybe two hours to finish. 
So out of a 24-hour day, I have between five and seven hours of constant reminder of addiction. A constant reminder on how to be, uh, live with recovery and how to come up with educational tools. So try AA. It might even help you. If that doesn't help, try my methods, which are pretty simple. I have my website, www.clearviews.info, which is full of information on recovery of alcohol and or drugs. I have videos that I do. I have now a total of 80, let's see, 16 and 66, 82 videos that you can watch. You can go right onto YouTube. Folks, you can even take one of my videos and plaster it wherever you want. I have left the uh, authorization for anyone to go onto YouTube and take the embedded code to put it wherever you want. And the reason I did that is because my videos have already been to a couple AA meetings. They've already hit one or two schools from what I understand from uh, friends of mine. Uh, the segment on uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving and Students Against Drunk Driving. These videos are there to help you. These videos are not here for entertainment purposes. They are here for educational purposes. So take any video you want from YouTube. Utilize my methods. Utilize AA. And folks, I say this, if you are a person that is not strong enough to tackle addiction recovery without being supervised, and what does that mean? It means can you be at home and not go to the refrigerator or go into the liquor cabinet? To drink can you be at home if nobody is at home with you can you do that if your answer is no you might want to check yourself into a treatment center and if you go to www.clearviews.info on between pages six and eight you'll find an icon on the header that says uh, rehab and treatment centers click on that I have two full columns of 50 states Click on the state you're in, and you might find a treatment center nearby you. If not, just go to the Google search bar, put in treatment center, and wherever you're located. Most treatment centers will take insurance and Medicaid. If for some reason they don't, and you don't have insurance at all, go onto your state's website. A lot of states offer it. I do know for New Hampshire, I was able to find something for someone. Utilize that. But whether it's my methods or AA or it's the treatment center. Don't automatically think ever that your addiction is fixed. I sit before you very humbly to tell you right now that my addiction is not fixed. What is fixed is the fact that I have learned to live with it 24 hours at a time. That is the fix. I fix it only for 24 hours at a time. Then I fix it tomorrow again for 24 hours. But folks, no matter what method you try, you need, and I repeat, you need to include your higher power. You need to include. Perfect example, folks. When you go to bed at night, take your slippers off and push them all the way under your bed. Why do you think I might say that to you? It's because when you wake up in the morning, I want you to have every reason in the world to be thankful. And how better to be thankful that when you drop to your knees to go and get those slippers from under your bed that you just throw in a little prayer to your Lord Jesus. Take your slippers or your sneakers, put them under your bed. So when you do drop to your knees to go and get them from underneath your bed, you thank the Lord for another day that you are alive. Thank the Lord for your family that you have. Thank the Lord that you have a roof and you have food. Because we all have things to be thankful for, but we take for granted that they're always going to be there. And folks, I'm here to tell you right now, not everything is guaranteed in life. You might not even have a tomorrow. That is why it's so important to start today, September 15th, to start writing your chapters in your book of life differently than what it has been. And if you're the type of person that says, well, my chapters have been good, that is great, but we always have room for improvement. I can't say that all my chapters were good. I've always been a good human, but as long as I had the addiction, an addiction will make you as a semi-decent human, if not a bad human. 
In my heart and in my soul, I was always good, but my body told me otherwise. My body needed to be fed with alcohol, which made me say things, which made me do things, which made me different than I really am. That is not who I am and is certainly not who God created. So when you go to bed tonight, start tonight rewriting your chapters in your book of life. Put your slippers halfway under your bed. So when you do get up tomorrow morning, you will have to drop to your knees to go get those slippers. And while you're dropping to your knees, say thank you to the Lord Jesus for another day given to you. Because it's a privilege to live. It's not something that is, is uh, guaranteed every single day. Folks, if you have possessions, if you have extra money, share it with people. If you have extra furniture and food, share it with people. Don't think for one minute there will be a U-Haul truck behind your hearse one day. You cannot take it. You came to this world alone and that's how you are going to leave this world. You came to this world not knowing Jesus. But throughout your life, people have told you about God and Jesus have told you how to write your book, your chapters in your book of life. It is up to you to do that. So when you do leave this world, wouldn't it be nice to know that you're leaving this world knowing that you have God or Jesus in your heart, whoever your higher power might be. Drop to your knees every once in a while and thank God for whatever you have. You will never, ever achieve anything in life, folks, without a goal. And my definition of a goal is an action plan. In order to have a well-balanced home, you need to let sunshine into your heart and into your home to have positive results. So what is your action plan? Your action plan is not to drink, not to smoke, not to use profanity, and certainly not to physically abuse anyone. That is your action plan. If you don't have those action plans, set them right now. Another action plan for a well-balanced home is to go into your medicine cabinet, which I choose to call Mr. Medicine Cabinet. He's a legal drug dealer in your home. Eliminate any addictive drugs that are in there. If there are uh, drugs that are meant for you, that's exactly what they're meant for, or your wife or whoever. They are not meant for people that might have addictive personalities. I had uh, have an addictive personality that's alcohol I have not learned now to put a shield around me to fight off the addiction and that behavior we all have some sort of di addictive personalities but when you leave drugs addictive drugs in your medicine cabinet you are not having a well-balanced home eliminated and what's good about sitting at the dinner table at night with your children is, is it's an open forum you will hear and find things out Things such as peer pressure, how can you then as a parent help? Things as alcohol and drug usage, how can you as a parent help? Things as maybe they're hanging around with the wrong crowd. Folks, it really comes down to everything starts in your home. And if you include your higher power, your God in your home, if God is sitting at that dinner table at night or in, in, in the uh, den watching TV with you folks, no that God, if he's in your home and you allow him to be in your home, you are protected better than any security system in the world. Everything happens for a reason, folks. Everything in life happens for a reason. And I do believe in karma. So if you are one of the people that thinks that there's going to be a U-Haul behind that hearse when you die, karma is such a simple thing. What comes around goes around. If you're good, you'll get good. If you're bad, you'll get bad. So if you truly believe that, that that U-Haul story, stop. Uh, start disbelieving it because there won't be a U-Haul. Start sharing whatever you might have. It is such a good thing to see a smile on somebody's face that you have just helped. I do this for me, but I do it to help you because I know deep down inside there is somebody out there. Somebody's watching me that has an addiction. Somebody is watching me that knows somebody with an addiction. And that's what I do this for. It's to help me help you. So we have the different methods. We have the story about the U-Haul truck. We have nothing can be achieved without a goal. And we need to have action plans and we need to be a role model. We have all that. So now our life is becoming more well-balanced. We know about the chapters 
in the book of life from your birth to your end. We know that today, September 15th, is your first day if you allow it to be. Now if you want to push it aside and say maybe the next video I'll think about it, that is totally on you. But know this, there might not be another tomorrow. There might not be another video if I'm not around tomorrow. So think for today, act on today, and hopefully we all will have it tomorrow. That's really what it comes down to, folks. I just want to constantly say to all my friends that are out there that have reached out to me, that have said to me that, Ralph, I am totally broken down when it comes to addiction and I need help. I cannot do any more than sit here and wait for you to contact me. My phone number for texting is 631-599-0218. My phone number is 844-405-HELP. You can email me at clearreform at yahoo. That's C-L-E-A-R-R-E-F-O-R-M at yahoo. You can go to any one of my websites, clearviews.info or clearreform.com. You can go to Facebook. We have two pages there clearviews.info and clear reform and we also have an open group with I believe now 70 something people on it in it that's clear reform you can find me on Twitter Bing Google Yahoo Dogpile, dig many other forms I am here for my all my folks that I just uh, spoke about the people that reached out to me that have not been in contact with me I am here to help you but you need to reach out to me because you know where I am I can't reach out to you, nor will I call you constantly because I don't want to harass you because the worst thing to do for somebody that has an addiction is for me, for me to constantly come after you because that will drive you further towards the alcohol and or drugs. I won't do that. My friend up north, uh, here's another weekend uh, that just went and passed us. I am so proud of you. Keep it going. You are doing an excellent job. And uh, even though you had those bumps in the road, I am so proud of you. And just keep up all the good work. From my friend up in New Hampshire, um, I read what you wrote on Facebook yesterday. And uh, I feel for you. That's all I can really say about that. I don't want to say what I read. And I don't want to say who you are. Uh, because thousands of people see this video. And, but I'm just saying is that I feel for you. I am here for you to reach out to me for any, and I mean anything. I am an ear. I can help you with uh, providing the rehab center again if we need to try that rehab uh, or that avenue again. Your family member sounds to me like is totally out of control and you need to possibly reach out to other people to help you. You can't do this alone. It is not good for you and I don't want you to possibly go into some sort of addiction because of this go back into this grief and alcohol abuse thing quickly we're up to 50 minutes already types of grief remember we talked about that there is five different types of griefs uh, it begins to take form during the first four stages the emotions it, you have the emotional experiences that a grief uh, a person in grief will have then you have the, uh, uh, the, the feelings of loss the isolation the uh, traumatic feelings, those are all feelings that people are going to go through. Um, let's go right to the seven steps. The first step would be to listen, to listen, to listen. That is one of my biggest things that I have to do as a master addiction recovery coach. I will not run my lips. I will listen. I will just sit there and nod my head. I will give you whatever information you need upon request. Listen even when your friend doesn't say anything. Look at body language. Look at expressions. You can learn so much. And this is how when I talked about family dinners, you can learn so much from your children by body uh, language. Know the five stages. The five stages, stages are isolation, excuse me, are denial, isolation, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. Those are the five stages. Uh, Stages. Understand that everyone grieves differently. If the loved one that you're helping through this grieving process takes two years, so let it be. Takes five minutes, so let it be. Doesn't show any sign, let it be. Let them grieve in their own way. If it has become where they're not eating, try preparing meals for them in a Tupperware and let them maybe pop it in the microwave. Uh, if they're not showering anything as such, Try to help them in whatever way you can. Offer to help pay the bills, not from your own funds, but maybe through them. 
help them with their newspaper collecting off the driveway, getting the mail in, whatever. If all that fails, you might have to look into intervention. You might have to. Move to bereave to recovery. You need to push slowly, like a snail. Push this person along. Don't let this person just come to a dead stop in the middle of nowhere. As the person grieving passes through the worst of the grief, the comforter, meaning you and me, can help move him or her forward. You need to do that. Create boundaries. What we need to do is a grieving person needs to uh, know that you will only do so much to help this person. So we need to be there for that. Folks, this has been a very good lesson. Uh, I just want to touch base on you never see a U-Haul uh, a behind a hearse. But bottom line to that is, is share what you have while you're living because you can't take it with you. Set your priorities for your goals. A major part of successful living lies in the ability to put things first. Indeed, the reason most major goals are not achieved is that we spend hours uh, too much time doing second things first. And folks, if you were trying to achieve anything in life, anything whatsoever, it is to uh, set a goal because you're not going to achieve without a goal. And folks, I'm going to say this quickly. Tonight, let's all do this. When we go to bed, put your slippers, your sneakers, your shoes under your bed halfway through. That way, when you wake up in the morning, it gives you a reason to drop to your knees to go and get them. And when you're down there, when you drop to your knees, thank your Lord Jesus Christ that you made another day, that you're alive, and you still have your loved ones in your life. And if you are going through where you're helping loved ones going through the grieving process, proceed everything with caution. Be sensitive to their needs, yet be uh, suggestive in trying to help them. But listen, listen, and listen. That's really the bottom line, folks. I just want to give a shout out one more time to Dr. Luis Gonzalez, 844-414-8444. That's www.startingpointmn.com. And you can also give me a call at 844-405-HELP or text me at 631-599-0218. You can also go to either website for information purposes. You can go to www.clearviews.info or for uh, if you need help coaching, www.clearreform.com. You have those two websites there to reach out to me. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Dig, Bing, Yahoo, Google. You can find me in all those places, Instagram. Reach out to me. Let me help you. And remember this when I tell you one more time. Push your sneakers or your slippers under the bed tonight before you go to sleep. So when you wake up in the morning and you need to put them back on, it gives you a reason to drop to your knees and pray to God that you have another day on this beautiful earth. Be a role model at home. Let the sun shine into your heart and into your home to give you nothing but positive uh, uh, results because if you let the darkness into your home you will not have nothing but negative results remember a sober today guarantees you a better tomorrow and if you believe it here you will see it clear wherever you might be wherever in my audience you are if you believe it here you will see it clear there I thank you so much for coming uh, tomorrow we have a whole nother show try to remember some of the stuff I told you about today but definitely please Push your sneakers or your slippers under your bed tonight. So when you wake up in the morning, you will drop to your knees to go get them. And while you're on your knees, pray to God that you and thank your God that you have another day on this beautiful, beautiful earth. Thank you very much. Sober today makes for a better tomorrow. And please stay sober for the rest of the day. Thank you. God bless you.